And the final panelist, Zephyr Teachout, she's a uh, associate professor of law at Fordham University, but you may know her <laughs> better, better as uh, having sought the Democratic nomination for governor of New York, and she came in second with more than a third of the vote. So I'm sure there are people here who may have voted for her as well. So thank you for being here. Thank you. I feel like a, um, somebody who used to be a great marathoner who hasn't <laughs> run for a while, coming back. Because <sighs> this used to be my people. <laughs> I was uh, the national director of the Sunlight Foundation. We did some of the first crowdsourced journalism. I'm sorry. <laughs> Well, anyway, so what I want to tell you is that the house is on fire. <laughs> uh, no, but um, so I'm not going to talk about the sort of tech opportunities, which is an area that I love and would love to get into. I want to talk about uh, morality, and I want to talk about power. And I have three very simple points. The first is that, um, thank you for the note, but I do think the house is on fire in terms of our democracy. And the last time that we had this level of concentrated power and inequality in our country, the single most important force that allowed us to get out of it was the journalists. So the 1907 Tillman Act, which prohibited direct corporate contributions to campaigns, was not really supported by the Democrats and not really supported by the Republicans. But you couldn't find a single major paper in the country, including the Wall Street Journal and Cosmopolitan, that wasn't talking about the importance of getting corporate direct funding out of campaigns. In fact, you can't make sense of our successful escape from 1900. And I think about 1900 all the time, because we'd fought a civil war and had you know, no meaningful political or economic rights for African Americans. Suffragists, suffragists had been around and yet women couldn't vote and the populace had failed. There's no way to make sense of what we did after 1900 without understanding the power of incredibly feisty, committed populist journalists. So I can't tell you how to make a buck. But I can tell you that if journalists stay on the sidelines and see what is happening in politics as an interesting terrible tragedy as opposed to something that you are deeply and personally invested in, we are all in trouble. You can't make sense of the civil rights movement without journalists. So that's the first point. The second is also about power. And I think there's an opportunity here, and I don't, I don't have an answer for you. But I think a lot of people, I'm, I'm coming in and out of, uh, can you guys hear me OK? Is that better? Um, so what I, what I see in political reporting, and I think many people probably see this, is a kind of dissonance between two different kinds of reporting. Can I just, can you, is this better? No, it, okay. it just it put it back, here. put it back yeah, where it was. Yeah. Okay. We could hear you. You just, you get the Coriolis yeah. effect. Um, so on, you'll see one day a report as if we are in the West Wing Lang, land, West Wing land, where you talk about the key players being the individual candidates, the political parties, and another report another day about money and politics. But these aren't fused in a meaningful way. So instead, I think there's a sense of unreality when people read about politics, because they're not getting a complete, continuous portrait of power. Um, instead, we're still acting, and I, and I don't blame journalists for this, I just feel like you've been in West Wing land, or maybe even House of Cards land, where the key er characters are parties and politicians, and we're suddenly in Game of Thrones. So how do you then report on this new power reality in a meaningful way? So what you'll see is somebody like you know, Dan Loeb, somebody who's gotten very politically involved in New York politics. Do you know who he is? You may know him as a hedge fund person, not in terms of his political involvement. So there'll be maybe one story about Dan Loeb and the amount of contributions he's made. But if this is Game of Thrones, you want to hear an ongoing story about what he's doing, because he is actually the key political figure. The individual story doesn't cut it. The ongoing narrative requires the ongoing storytelling about these characters. You see this maybe with the Koch brothers, but they're sort of a rarity. 
And in fact, you know, you saw the recent Princeton study about uh, th this country being more of an oligarchy than a democracy. It requires a different kind of reporting than the kind of reporting we've had with a different cast of characters instead of the reporting from the 1990s. Um, I guess my last point is more about, so I guess I'll just make one, I have, I have one tech idea, but I'm not gonna tell it to you. <laughs> So the last sort of example of that I see is in something like Amazon. So I see Amazon as one of the most important political players in the country right now. Jeff Bezos is not only taking over the supply chain of a great number of ideas in our country, but has bought the Washington Post. So it carries a veto over any time there's gonna be a change in the sales tax of the internet, or a veto over any time there's gonna be a change in antitrust policy or pricing law which Brandeis, among others, thought was one of the most important sources of, of uh, power for taking on concentrated power. But again, we rarely see Bezos as a political figure. Again, it's an accidental as opposed to an ongoing story. So what I see in this country is an extraordinary sleeping giant in terms of people who care about politics and want to get engaged in politics, but don't find truthful political storytelling in the papers and news media that they see. And so I hope that there's also an opportunity to return to the profit model of the penny press journalism, not just the political power of the penny press journalism. Thank you. Great, thank you.